Hi everyone, welcome to this week's podcast and video. So, this week I got something very special for you. On Saturday, I went up to Brisbane and I deliver a masterclass called Feminine Spirit at the Perfect Potion Headquarter, celebrating International Women's Day 2019. And we talked a lot about goddess archetypes. We talked about hero and journey. I also talked about how actually goddess was the first deity being worshipped on Earth. But you know, women's、um, role and expectation has been changing ever since, and in the last hundred years, a lot have changed as well. So, I asked the question, "Who are we as women?" And I also talk about who are you as individual? What maybe your archetypes? What kind of problems and challenges you may face with your archetypes、um, on your hero and journey, the different stages of your life? So. That was what I call an empowerment session, and there was a lot of discussion and question and answers. And certainly couldn't take you with me, <laughs> but、um, I hope that I can do something and share something with you here. So I have specially recorded a standalone, which is basically showing you your, my presentation, and I recorded my voice over on it. So it's still a masterclass, and it's just different time, a slightly different format. So I hope you enjoy this week's video and podcast. So. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this masterclass recording. So today it's about our feminine spirit. I gave this talk、um, early on in the month to celebrate International Women's Day. So it's a special recording of the same presentation without obviously the live interaction. But I had such a great time sharing it with my audience, and I thought, what could be the next best thing? So I decided to record it so they can watch it as video or audio. So today we're going to talk about hero and journey, a woman's transformation to embrace love, courage, and power. So this is a standalone recording that will be shorter than the live talk, but I think we cover quite a lot of different topics today. So I hope you will enjoy today's recording. So the first question I asked was about who are we as women in these modern times.、Um, as the background I shared,、uh, I gave this talk first time to、um, at a special event to celebrate International Women's Day. So obviously we think about so who are we as women? So. Uh, you see the role model in our family, your mom or your grandma or your auntie or people, friends, friends.、Um, we can be many things: teachers, healers, mothers, nurturers, listener, caretaker. You know, there are so many different roles and expectation, and they have been changing through time. And I shared my story with the audience.、Um, About my grandmother, so I have two grandmother on my father's side, and the first grandma we call the Hong Kong grandma because she moved to Hong Kong from China, and when I was very little, so we actually used to live together. So me and my mom and dad moved from China to Hong Kong when I was two, and when I was about six years old, we start living with grandma, the Hong Kong grandma. The reason why we call her the Hong Kong grandma is because we have two, right? One of them went to Hong Kong, the other one stay in China. So I call her the China grandma. So obviously,、um, I get to know my Hong Kong grandma a little bit more because we used to live together. And what I discovered that her reputation was always be cold, grumpy,、uh, you know,、um, difficult to be with, and stubborn. And all of these things may be true, but then through living with her and through observation, I think I came to know a little bit more about the why. So on the other hand, my China grandma, she's a very loving, very nurturing woman, and、uh, she did so much for the family, the cooking and the cleaning, and everybody came through our family home in China, like came for meals and gatherings. So there's a lot for her to do, and she had、um, she gave birth to four kids, and my father. Uh, is the oldest son. So this is the story. Basically, Hong Kong grandma and my grandpa was、um, arranged marriage. So they got married through that. And because you couldn't give birth to any children, and in old days, really that was a problem. As in,、um, you know, he he had to find someone else, or they have to be other ways. You know, anyhow. So he then fell in love with my China grandma through work and acquaintances. So、um, they got together, and she gave birth to four kids. Were they legally married? I don't know. You know, that was like six years ago in China. However, 
it puts such a、um, shame on my Hong Kong grandma's shoulder. Oh, she felt herself. Everybody respected her. Everybody understood. Back in those days, you need children, you need people to to work to support the family. So. I got it, you know. Of course, now we will say, "Oh, that's so wrong." If you have two wives, but it's illegal. But back then, it's very different. Besides,、um, she she was very upset by that, and、uh, even though everybody respected her, it was it was painful emotionally. And back then, there was not much to、um, to talk about. People don't really think they have a voice or choice, and even if they do believe, they didn't think they had much power to do anything about it. So anyway. She、um, moved to Hong Kong and she worked as a maid and seamstress, support herself.、Um, and then my Hong Kong grandma later on moved in with us, as I mentioned, and my China grandma remained in China. And occasionally they would visit, like as in,、um, you know, these two grandma would meet, and and I could tell my China grandma carried a lot more.、Um, Guilt compared to my Hong Kong grammar. So one woman having a lot of shame, the other woman have a lot of guilt, and none of this was their fault, right? And it was circumstantial and was challenging times. So no one really talked about anything, and they didn't have much support, but they just carry on doing the best they could, and it was difficult time. Um, so when I, what I came to realize is that every woman has a story, and just because I lived with my Hong Kong grandma, I got to know her. So I know her stubbornness come from her struggle, her coldness, or her、um, difficult sort of、um, feeling around her is because she was unease, she wasn't happy, and. So and with my China grandma, one of the reason why she worked all like you know she did hundred and fifty percent that you ask of her is because she felt she had to compensate. There's a lot of you know earning her place in the family, which they carry so much on the shoulder. Even in the subsequent later years of my Hong Kong grandma, there was a lot of that she wants to do, like she want to help us to you know cook and look after me when she got older, when she couldn't really. She she was very upset by that, and obviously we didn't. But see, what I'm trying to say is that we women carry a lot this emotional baggage and. You know, in the old days, there are not many ways to release them, and there are not many people to listen or help you to make changes in life. So this all got to change、um, when we being more liberated. And one thing I want to talk about is that we are bounded and controlled by fear, but we can only be liberated by love. And recently, I heard a few talks.、Um, Or I read a few books that somehow had this theme all throughout that we can only be liberated by love. If someone was there to listen to help, you can help someone to liberate all this burden. So I think you know one thing I would mention here is that it's so important to work with someone, have your support network, whether it's working through someone like myself, like which is a coach, or you talk to your sisters, like or like soul sisters, <laughs> or friends that can help you. But don't don't think you have to do this alone. Every woman have a story. You have yours. Your mother has hers. Every family has one. And to be truly empowered, we must liberate ourselves from this burden because there's more to do when we are free. Because then we can pursue. When we're carrying this baggage, you can imagine how hard it is going to run for anything, right? So, and、um, I think this is the question we'll keep pondering about: Who are we? Who are we now? So not so long ago, as you can see from this slide, basically about only by 1900, women in most of developed countries allowed to own were allowed to own land and property. And before that, a lot of times you have to marry. And even today, many in many societies, if you don't marry or you don't marry someone well, you you really may have difficulty to have a place in the society. And with university admittance, it's only about 150 years ago women were allowed to go to universities to study. In fact, my first university, University College of London, was the first one who admitted women. And it's not about letting them to, you know, go and study and listen to the lectures, but to actually let them to take the exams and therefore graduate. The first university admittance was happening in 1868. In terms of voting right, as you could see, I put this picture here because it's a huge milestone for women when we were allowed to vote. So, 
The first country in the world that, that allowed women to vote was actually New Zealand in 1893. Some of you may know, and Australia was also one of the first countries. I would say different states have different time, but by the 1902, basically all of Australia women had a right to vote.、Um, the UK and US finally began allowing women to vote in 1920, and King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia only granted women the right to vote in 2019. So we came far. We that was a we came a long way, but still there are, you know, countries that we need to look at, and they haven't got the same right as we do now.、Um, so the photo I show you, I found it was very empowering because you know, none of this was easy. Sometimes doing the right thing. You, because you had call for it, because you know our sisters needed, the whole society needed, but it was never easy. It was never a big majority of people and say, "Hey, you wake up one day and decided to give women the power to vote." No, it was a small group of powerful women who speak up, who stand up and do the right thing. So in the photo, you saw the the two old older lady on the left bottom corner. That is、um, on the left is Susan B. Anthony, and、um, the other one was、um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So these two、uh, lady, they were the really the first who began the women's movement in I would say eighteen thirty six, and I think the real movement started probably about、uh, later the eighteen hundred. And in fact, it took fifty years sort of officially since the movement started to get the women to vote、uh, to to have the right to vote. In 1920, so that was a long journey, and you saw there's a lot of women.、Um, later on, then in America, I'm talking about the National American Woman Suffrage Association under the leadership of Carrie Chapman Catt and the National Women's Party under the leadership of Alice Paul. These two, you like, joined forces, and at the end of the day, they managed to make Congress to pass the bill. So that was a long. You know, struggle, and you know, as you know, many stories. So they were,、um, they were hunger strike. They were forced that. There was a lot of,、um, let's don't even call it uncomfortableness. It was challenging, but they did it. And you know, these are women before us. And now, obviously, things have changed a lot、um, since then. We see a lot more CEOs,、um, people in leadership in、um, in different countries. Um, we have prime ministers and、um, lots of fair empowered women, and、um, that was、uh, so for the last hundred years. A lot has happened, and it was not easy, but it really showed us something. We have the power to change, and even though it was difficult, but you know what's so interesting was that、um, things were not quite like that before. So I'll go back to that in just a little bit. But I want to mention sometimes these huge milestones reached by women who really answered the call in the heart, and some of them really come from nothing. Like Susan B. Anthony, she was born in a Quaker family. She was a teacher. She wasn't, you know, any have any background or any finances to support her. Or two other women I want to mention here. I think the great example of、um, empowered women. In different ways. So one of them is Irina Sandler or Sandlerova. She was a Polish social worker and a nurse. And many of you may know her story: how she was working in the Nazi concentration camp, and she smuggled little children out of the camp. She actually managed to save two thousand five hundred children. Um, and obviously, she got caught, and she was, you know, imprisoned, and she was punished severely. And、um, as I think the story goes, that on the day of her execution, she got rescued, and the underground movement basically bribed a guard or something and managed to rescue her. And in fact, she was obviously she survived、um, the Second World War. And after the war, she she also put in her effort to help those children she smuggled out to find the family. If they were there, like if if that's possible, or find them to be and help them to get adopted. So not only you smuggle the kids out, you have to help them to to make papers and help them to find family or orphanage to 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 host them. And after the war, she tried to help them to、um, find their own family, which is a tremendous effort. And let alone how much she suffered after she got caught. And then she was up for Nobel Prize nomination two thousand and seven and two thousand and eight. So twice. <laughs> she didn't win, but she was very close. I think she lost one. I think two thousand seven 
I'm not wrong. Al Gore won the one for global warming, and she was the runner-up or something. But anyway, huge effort. I felt really to mention her because her story really touched my heart.、Um, again, came from nothing. And another one I really want to talk about is Oprah, where again,、um, you know, back in I think she's the first、um, African American woman as a news anchor, first African American woman who's a billionaire, and in fact, she's a simple. Of symbol of empowerment of women who, who didn't come from you know any wealthy family or background. In fact, poverty.、Um, she was raped and abused, and it took a lot of, obviously a lot of effort and struggle and bravery to become who she is today to empower others and helping others. So, you know, there's a numerous examples that there are women who really make a huge difference in our lives and. I thought I will honor these people on this special presentation. But I want to say one thing: things were not always this way. Meaning, now we found we know about. I mean, some of you may know about this particular figure, and this is probably the one of the most famous figure in the Venus of Willendorf. It's only eleven centimeters tall.、Um, it's a stat like a figure in a Venus, and has been estimated being made between twenty five thousand. To twenty eight thousand BC, so basically, goddess was the first deity being worshipped since the beginning of mankind. So, and also not just about this one. There were many other figurines in the Paleolithic era, which is about fifty thousand BC. There was lots of goddess figurines were found. So, and they were found in a way where. Say there's a village and people have their own houses and they often find these goddess figurines outside the home, like protecting the home on the ground. So it's a common practice to worship the goddess. And no brainer. Look at this statue. It's really symbolizing fertility and a woman's ability to nurture.、Um, so I think it's a very logical idea that why the goddess was the first deity to be worshipped. Now this stopped、um, change, let's just say,、um, when、um, the patriarchy culture started to take over from 4,000 BC. So the Indo-European tribes, let's say the warrior, came through invading ancient Greece and also Mesopotamia, which is the modern Iraq,、um, as early as around 4,000 BC, and basically, really, they took over. Um, to I would say four thousand to two thousand five hundred BC, but you, you think about it. You know, at that time there were the agricultural tribes, the goddess worshippers, which is very much depending depending on plantations and growing what they eat. So they are not warriors. They have no chance. They are not the fighters. But what happened was that those invaders basically they did not just slaughter you all. They merged with the locals. So they will form families. They have unions, and so in fact. That it will all they all、um, reflected、um, the local mythologies. So I love Joseph Campbell's work, and he has studied mythology across different culture and geographies. So whether it's Africa, Asia, or you know what I say, and Mesopotamia or Greece, ancient Greece.、Um, when you look at the myths and when he compare them across different geography, he will find the same themes, and he also find the same pattern. Where these the gods start to marry the goddesses, or、um, the goddess start to become an equal partner, if not less. So there's definitely the change in the society when the warriors came through, as well as the mythology. So that's just you know it shows you because one thing is that mythology is often a reflection of our human psyche. So they talk about our fear, our hope, our relationship problems, our conflicts, our dreams, and these were reflected in. Myths, and we see the changes in myths because the local society is changing. So, and you know, as you have it, that Greek mythologies are great examples. So, we see the power of the goddess shifted、um, around that time. So, the ancient Greek mythology, the popular ones, as you know, it really started to form around two thousand BC, and they fully developed about seven hundred BC. So, that is exactly the time when the invaders came and really united with the local. Cultures, and you will see that the goddess myths also 
um, the dynamics have to change. So, for example, there was the saying when Zeus, you see Zeus have so many lovers and wives and mistresses and you know consuls, and it's basically the invaders almost like invading one valley and you marry to the local, and then you invade another valley and you will see Zeus also marrying one goddess, having another goddess, another mistress, and they just go on and on. And it's because that's what happened. Because the invaders came through from village to village, and and that's all reflected in the local folklore. So I find it fascinating. And also, if you look at some of the myths that I will share with you, um, Greek myths, you also find some of them in other cultures. So one of the primary example about themes that are common、um, among different cultures is about resurrection. So crucifixion, resurrection. Or、um, through death came new life, birth and rebirth. So, for example, the,、um, the ancient Egyptian goddess Iris, the fairy Isis, sorry, the very famous myth of her story, Osiris, was、um, obviously the death of Osiris and the resurrection and rebirth of him by his wife, which is Isis. Um, so that's the resurrection theme, and then you will find resurrection is a theme in so many different mythology in different cultures. So that's that's one of the very interesting fact. Now about the wisdom of the myths, which I have already talked about a little bit.、Um, what is definitely a phenomenon we can observe is that through these changes of the culture, the society, the collaborative nature of women. Being the center、um, of the tribe, being worshipped, the goddess being worshipped, that's a very strong collaborative nature. You take a village to raise a child, so the women was、um, the key predominant figure in the power. So when that changed to the matriarchy to patriarchy, it became a lot more competition type of nature, where even if you talk, you listen to the the myths of the gods, there's a lot of competition. Is who's the most powerful? Just look at Zeus myths. The fact that his father and his grandfather they took over each other's power by basically killing their own father. So that's called competition, if I might say. So、um, that's a really clear difference between that two、um, matriarchy and patriarchy culture, and it also reflect in the myths and reflect in the local culture again. Now I said before, the goddess is in many ways being downgraded, as in either sitting side by side, if not beneath. And there were lots of, you know, as you will hear later today, there were kidnapping of goddesses or without having the respect to consent with them. So it also shows something because that's all about the shift in power. Now, again, in today's world, things are changing. There is still inequality. Things are changing, but there there is that dynamic, and this is part of the talk for today. It's about how to balance the feminine and the masculine energy, because we need both. And I'm going to get to in just a minute. Now, looking at all these myths, and listening to everything I just said, I think there's one thing in common, which is about transformation. So, when I talked about how do we liberate from Our fear, or our, our worries, our doubt, our in feeling of inadequacy, to feeling confident, or feeling good enough, or give yourself permission to pursue your dream. That's a transformation, right? And it's basically a shift from fear to love. And in a course of miracle, there are two kinds of thoughts: love and fear. Now, in the course of miracles, it talks about only love is real. Fear is an illusion, and it's not real. And there is no opposite of love, and fear itself is an illusion. Now, obviously, you will say no, but fear is very real for you, and it's the same like having a nightmare. Dream is not real, but the effect, your feelings, your sweat, your uneasiness, the the way how you woke up from the nightmare, that's the effect, and that's really real, right? So, if love is um. If the predominant, the real force, fear itself can totally be let go when we see through it. Now, they said, I mean, in the Cosmic Miracle, it talks about you have only two kind of thoughts, and the one which is fear, which is a projection, 
and the other, which is the extension of love when you think and act with love. Now, I believe transformation always requires you to shift from letting go of the fear, whatever form it comes. And your love basically is whether it's a destination or a goal or a thing you want to achieve. That itself is what triggers the transformation.、Um, and all the myths that we're going to share, there is. Definitely, there is a part to it, like how Persephone, for instance, she was the maiden goddess, and she was kidnapped in the underworld, and how she became from a very innocent, very indecisive, and unsure herself goddess to become the queen of underworld. That's a huge transformation. She has to grow up. She has to mature. And what happened is that she has to let go of the fear of feeling of who she is and uncertain about the world, and also that all of that. And that's a step one. And going back to some of the examples、um, early on about empowered women, again, these the women in the suffragette movement, for instance, they have no like definite answers to whether they will succeed. In fact, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton did not see the day when the bill was signed. They both died in 1902 and 1906. So none of them see the light of the day where it would the, the dream came true. None of them. But they had just such a strong faith to do what's the right thing, and I think that's really powerful. Again, none of these women knew they could succeed at all. There's a lot of risk. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, you just don't know. But they did it, and even today we talk about them. So, I think really look at transformation in something that you don't know where you're going to be. You just need to do the right thing right now. And the next step we follow, the next step we follow, and you know, one of the first things is that when we're bounded by fear, like jealousy, anger, doubt, envy, worry, we go nowhere. We we just stay where we are, and we're going to talk about、um, human journey more detail in the, in a few more minutes. But I just want you to start thinking about it. You know, if we can be liberated, why wouldn't we? If that's the most powerful force that we can use, which is love and loving yourself, believing in yourself, it's one of it.、Um, why wouldn't why wouldn't we do it? So sometimes we need sort of like a pat on the shoulder from the angel, or you sometimes been pushed through from the cliff so that you can fly.、Um, I just think that this is something important to think about. Maybe it's about your relationship. Um, maybe your relationship at the moment isn't the way you like it. So think about where do you hold fear? Is it about worrying that if you, if you talk about the real big issue, it's going to you may lose the guy or girl, or is it because you're afraid you will never find anyone, or is it because you're so afraid that you're going to mess up? I don't know. But you ask yourself, where do you need to let go? What you need to forgive? Where's the part that you hold most fear? Or is it if it's about a job or career? If you're not happy, what what is holding you back? Understanding that will make a huge difference, and it all starts with the willingness to look at things differently. Because by knowing it, naming it, you really can start a change for the for the for the better. So. When I was giving a presentation, this is the time I pause and、I、ask people to think about it. What is that you would like to change in your life? What do you want more of? What do you want less of? This is important to check in from time to time with yourself because we got so busy doing what we're doing. Sometimes we just lost lost focus, lost direction, lost our vision. Are we really doing what we want to do in our life, or we're just checking boxes? So I want you to pause if you if you have time and instead of listening through, you can pause now and take your pen and paper and write down this the answer of these questions. What is that you would like to change? What do you want more of? What less of? Because it informs the next question: Who are you? The essence of you never changed. So, the late、um, Dr. Wing Dyer mentioned that if you squeeze an orange, orange juice comes out, not lemonade. So, who you are definitely govern what you do. And、um, I say you'd be a good orange, goddamn good orange. But、um, this is important to know who I, what are your dreams,、um, and also another thing I will share with you today is about goddess archetypes. 
Archetypes itself, it's as Carl Jung said, it, it's our universal unconscious pattern. So that these are the patterns that we born with. It's like a blueprint. It doesn't dictate everything, but definitely give you a sense of direction. What about your interest? About your inclination? About your personality? About the way you tackle relationships or work? It does. It definitely show you something about your inner psyche. It's a kind of pattern. Sometimes we don't know why we keep on. You know, choosing the same thing or、um, unable to let go of certain things. It's sometimes it's part of it is because it's so ingrained in our psyche, and part of it is because this is part of our archetypes. Although they change as you would grow older and more mature, or circumstances ask for it, there are these these are the blueprints. And very interesting. I will also share as we go through it how you may not be an Athena, but you will become one because it asks of you. So. Let's talk about archetypes, and I love to do an intuitive exercise when I was、um, doing this,、um, sharing about archetypes. So I'm gonna show you some pictures in a minute, and I want you to write down which one really resonate with you. As in, you really feel drawn to, attract to this image, and I try to like、um, hide a name, so you may still know who they are, but just play the game with me. And see which one you're most attracted to. This is the first one. You can pause. <laughs> This is the second, third, fourth. Number five, number six. Now, as I said, just let your intuition flows. So you can go back,、um, you can pause and go back and look at these images and see which one you're most attracted to. Now, it may or may not mean that's your most active goddess, or this is the archetype that you were born with. Sometimes it's actually who you need to work with. Activate or、um, something just sort of need attention, <clears throat> and I will go through them one by one、um, and show you what are they. And also, I will, before we start, I want to mention why I like to use goddess archetypes because there are many archetypes out there. Like warrior is one. Moses, you can say Moses is an archetype because if I mention Moses, you immediately get to that. That's a figure which leads people to the promised land. Who obviously it's about. Leadership, who is also about also about following your heart, is also about、um, faith and a spiritual leader. So you know, and I say warrior, you get it. When I say mother, you get it, right?、Um, so or inner child, and there are many ways to talk about archetypes. But I like goddess because two reasons. One,、um, I love the goddess myths because I think the lessons are profound and they are very important for women. And two, I think they're more complex. So, if I say warrior, it really felt very that one dimension to me. Now, if I talk about these goddesses, you will hear me; they are not one dimensional at all. So sometimes I will compare them as the chocolate and ice, or chocolate or vanilla ice cream. You can see they have two very distinctive flavor, but they're chocolate. And vanilla, it's like one dimensional <laughs> for me. But I would say goddess archetypes is almost like the chai ice cream, where there's a lot of flavor in it. But you get it, you know what chai tastes like. But is it complex? Yeah. And you know, sometimes you can have more ginger in your chai, more cinnamon, or you can add some chocolate flavor. So it's complex. So that's why I love goddess archetypes,、um, and that's what I use. But By all means. Also, I'm just going to talk about six major archetypes here. However, there are many, and you know, some of the goddesses really stand out for you. That could be one of the archetypes that you should look at. Um, it's not restricted to these.、Um, we just can cover everyone. And also remember, you can have more than one active in you, and they do change due to maturity or circumstance. So, let's get starting. So, first, one I want to talk to you is about Athena. Now, she's the goddess of wisdom and craft, and her archetype is the strategist. So, basically,、um, an Athena in a modern world, we say a young girl 
We love to read books. Do very good at school. She doesn't bully you. She just do her own thing. She's a focused goddess. There's only two out of six here are focused goddess in terms of projects or goals. In like focused that way. The other one are more relationship goddess. The the focus is on the relationship itself. Now she's certainly very smart, and she can do be a great business person, or academic, or scientist, or in government. You name it. She strategizes. She's a right hand person of the CEO. If she's not a CEO, she thrives in the, um, the city in, and institutions. So she's very smart and very strategic. And one of her.、Um, One of her myths. I mean, there's so many, but I couldn't talk about them all here. And if you're interested, please get my book,、um, Goddess with Many Faces. There's a lot more details into it. But I just want to pick out some important ones. And one of the thing I want to emphasize about Goddess Architects is that they help us to understand our pattern, but also others. And therefore, I I love to use this example as in because. Athena is so much in her head and very smart. So if she's your sister, if you come crying to her and say, "I just got dumped by my boyfriend," she's probably going to say something like, "He's not very good for you, so that's better for you. You should read this book. That's going to help, or maybe this counselor can help you, or、um, I'm going to get you a holiday so you can relax yourself." But she may not give you a very big warm hug and cry with you. That's not her. That's not the way she expressed love. And sometimes we feel Athena seems so cold, but it's not. It's just the way she is. Maybe for her, the most caring effort is to tell you, "It's better without him." <laughs> so, by understanding that pattern of yours, maybe you someone also like a diameter, which is very caring, and for you, you really needed a bit more care, a hug, or something more warm than what Athena normally can provide. So that helps you to understand the nature of your relationship with others, which I think is very helpful because a lot of time is the lack of it that makes it feel separated, make us feel uncomfortable to communicate. So if we pull down these barriers, and that a lot of things can change. It's about in, inviting a deeper understanding of one another. It's about trying to be more accepting of one another. So. I will emphasize a little bit more about relationship with the archetypes than the myths because you can read all the myths in my book and they're really fun and every one of them has a message has a it shows something about the archetype and you know one of the thing about Athena I mentioned here though is that she's definitely a、um, daddy's girl or daddy's is not the right thing to say but like definitely she、um, admire her father or she work very well with a male a strong male figure. So she's not that kind of woman that she does definitely like to, you know, be the CEO. But she's not so much fighting with the men, but actually working with them. So she's a patron of heroes. She she's a patron of Achilles. So I think I talked about the myths in Odysseus, um, about how she helped Achilles, um, in the battle with Hector, in the story of Troy. Um, so read about it. I think it's fascinating. She's definitely a strategist. She sees the big picture. She's patient. Now, I want to talk about how you may not be a natural Athena, as in you actually born as an Artemis. However, let's say your parents are very distant, they're working overseas, or whatever reason, and you're the oldest daughter. You have to look after everybody. So you may become an Diameter, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, or Athena. Be very organized. Make sure all your brother and sister are fed and go to school and so forth. You may become an Athena because of circumstance. So this is a few things to be mindful of. And I wanted to give you a modern example because I think a lot of these things can be very intellectual. So I try to give you exercise so that you can relate and you can really practice and anchor what you have in your heart. Head, sorry, <laughs> with your heart. But I think modern example can also help you to get what I'm trying to say. So the example I want to give you for Athena, which could be very surprising for a lot of people, is Gabriel Chanel, because I think Chanel for me she's definitely Athena. She has been very smart in terms of you know again from a very humble beginning,、um, she was a seamstress and she made her way up and eventually she had patron,、um, and she became the Chanel as we know it. And she is so dedicated to her craft. Um, she, for me, she's an Athena in so many ways, and 
also surprised me. You know,、um, goddess of Athena. She's also a goddess of craft, not just wisdom, but craft. And she loved to make beautiful, useful, practical things like、uh, baskets or some sort of plate or whatever things are useful. And I think there's something about Chanel's early design also about very practical for women. You have pants and suits, and they obviously show you like more、um, still very feminine, but definitely have a masculine、uh, theme to it because want to enable women. You know, so I think that was something about her that really reminded me of Athena. Now, next one is Artemis, the goddess of moon and hunt.、Um, her archetype is activist and protector. So Artemis is someone who loves to run in the nature, loves the outdoor, loves the sky with stars and moon.、Uh, she loves to protect others. She's an activist, say for human rights, women's rights, children's rights,、um, the nature, the environment, the animals.、Um, She definitely loves to protect the weak.、Uh, she's also very fair as a person. So she's, you know, she's more compared to Athena. She will be the fighting against the man instead of working with the man type. Because if she sees something is wrong, she can be very、um, assertive with her energy, and because she want to make it right, and she care deeply. She's a wild spirit, often to be someone maybe very sporty, you can say, or just love the nature. And in her myths, and she asks Zeus to basically give her the freedom to roam in the wilderness, to hunt with the animals, run with the animals, get her the best、um, arrow and bow, and so she can just do her thing, which is hunting in short tunic. So that was her the favorite activity. So、um, very powerful goddess. She get things done for environment, for the animals, and the modern example I have for you here is Jane Goodall. Um, because Dr. Goodall really spent a lot of time in the nature, studying chimpanzee, and did a lot of things about the conservation of environment, which is, I think, a very clear example. You have to have that passion. You have to have that love.、Um, she's a very powerful goddess, and when Artemis and Athena join force together, they're unstoppable. They both focus、um, goddess. Artemis also very competitive. You know the、um, sharp arrow thing. She, you know, what she what she aim, she gets. So very, very competitive, very focused. So with Athena together, Athena is more strategic. So she may not like quickly shoot an arrow and kill that thing, but she will think about what be be the best way to win the battle. So she chooses her battle. So again, joint forces or hybrid are probably the most powerful. That will be the powerful leader of today's world that you can see a woman. Um, as women, so next thing we got is Diameter. So again, read the myths in the book.、Um, very interesting goddess.、Um, so she's a goddess of grain and harvest, and her archetype is Mother Nurture. You're lucky if you have a Diameter in your life because she will look after you. She she gives her love to you. She may cook. She may. You know,、um, do things that really that you that type when you're sick, she will come and do you want some chicken soup? Or if you have her as a mother, sometimes maybe over motherly, but she definitely dedicated herself. So, oh, I haven't mentioned the the shadow side. So Athena, you probably gather that she's very headstrong, so she may not connect with her heart as much as she needs to, especially in later years when you grow more mature. So that's a big thing. For Artemis, we talk about she's very competitive. So be careful, don't be over competitive because sometimes it may actually backfire. Or、um, too assertive, it also may not help you to to really win the situation. So these are the two for the very focused goddess. But for Diameter, it's clearly the burnout because if you put everybody first, sometimes you just don't look after yourself well enough. And then you may also get frustrated about it, and that's when it really hurts. Where you felt you throw yourself out there that you may not be respected or appreciated enough, and you know that become a vicious circle.、Um, so be mindful of that. But anyway, she's a very powerful goddess. She's um, it's just a mother. And with the myth with Pers-、uh, Persephone, as we mentioned, when Persephone was kidnapped, basically. 
um, Diameter was so upset. So the whole world was winter. Nothing grows because she's the goddess of harvest, right? Everybody starved. And so that's the same thing. When a Diameter is burned out and having like a breakdown or something, everybody else around her are affected because first of all, she used to look after everybody. And second of all, she's very powerful and slightly dramatic maybe. So when she got sick, then really it's going to be very hard for everybody else too. Now, I'm going to move through this quite fast because I really think that you will get more out of the book if you read the story. But you just, I just want to give you a brief overview because it helps me to talk about the who are you question. Now, Persephone, the maiden goddess, the queen of underworld, and her archetype is the mystic. Oh, I, I forgot to mention, the modern example I would like to give for Diameter is Mother Teresa. Because um, I want to talk about someone who is actually caring. She she may work in a nursing profession, in a counseling, like helping profession. And as far as I know it, Mother Teresa really dedicated her life to help the poor, the sick, the children until the last breath. You know, so for me, that's that's big. Um, for Persephone, the daughter of Diameter, her active is actually the mystic. Now, a few things I need to mention about Persephone. So her. Her myth primarily is that she got kidnapped when she was young and she was dragged into the underworld. She was frightened and because she eventually reunited with the Amata, which is fine, but because that sudden change in her life, that really changed her um, to become a more mature woman. And she, she took some seats from the underworld, so she has to return to the underworld. So that makes her eventually become the queen, because later on she was guiding the soul who just passed over. Now, I'm completely shortened the whole myth, so read about it in the book. But what I want to say is that typically a Persephone is someone often look eternally youthful and beautiful, who have a more soft and feminine appeal, because she's the maiden, right? And maybe came across as indecisive, or not as confident as you would say with Artemis or Athena, but she's not someone who doesn't have a mind of her own, but she may not fully formed it and share with you just yet. She's observing, she's ticking in, um, but she's usually quite carefree and happy until something happened, something, you know, so like the carpet pulled out under her feet. Could be um, an illness in the family, change of finances, because you can have Persephone um, as a young maiden architect in you until you're a lot older than, you know, a teenage girl. But you, what I'm trying to say is usually a major challenge will really trigger the transformation. So it could be a death of someone, change of work, relocation, parents' divorce, whatever, you name it, challenges. Then you really need to think who you are, what you want to be. You may have found it very emotionally challenging for a period of time. The good news is that you can come out of it. When you do, you know a lot better about who you are and what you want in life. So in Persephone's case, she really stepped up and you know later on she guided people um, as the queen of the underworld to help them. Uh, I won't say lost soul, not lost soul, but they just passed over, so they were uncertain. So she was helping those. And usually a perception is very um, intuitive and sensitive. So that's also a lot of, it's her strength as well. She really can understand people in a deeper level. Um, subconsciously, she's also very aware. She can shift her mind from thinking, you know, the upper world, which is the logic, the conscious. She can definitely dive deep in into the unconscious. So very powerful goddess in that way. And her archetype is the mystic. Now, some of them may be even medium or um, intuitive or oracle tarot card reader. If you're interested in that, there's a chance that you do have that archetype or that goddess influence in you. Now, the modern example I want to share with you is actually J.K. Rowling because I think she definitely had a challenging period when she was a single mother on, on welfare. And um, that was her challenge, but that's also her journey to grow and to become who she is today. And she found one thing that defines her or that is her love, which is her writing. And that's so important because once she know what it is and once she work at it and use it as her rope, she climb out that tunnel. And I think that's very true for any Persephone out there. So, and I love that journey, that transformation. And I think her story is most dramatic in a way to, to symbolize a woman's transformation. Then we got Hera, 
which is the goddess of marriage and queen of Olympia. So her archetype is the queen. So she's someone who is confident, very um, beautiful woman, well put together. She thrives in a partnership. So definitely marriage, goddess of marriage. So she loved to be married.、Um, In the old days, more so because kind of as I said before, you have to marry into social status almost because it's much harder for a woman to, you know, have work opportunity and so forth. But now this is changing. But still, that is deep in our psyche to be partner of someone to be in a partnership. And you know, I didn't have any traces of hair until I was a lot older. Like、um, I think. After a couple years dating my now husband, I felt that this call for a formal committed partnership, and I think that was sort of like I don't know making ourselves king and queen. But there is this feeling that this should be a little bit more、um, sacred, as in a commitment.、Um, I don't know how to put it, but there is a feeling I wanted it more than ever before. So, and then we got married, and now we have. A baby girl, so for me maybe it's a progression of some sort.、Um, everybody goes through their own journey. So, but for me definitely,、um, Hera is a regal woman. She's beautiful, confident.、Um, the thing is about her myth we get to hear is she's very moody or she got angry because Zeus was cheating on her. It's because it violated the code of loyalty, honesty, and trust. So she's someone you can trust.、Um, she. She plays a very high value in that, and when Zeus violates that, that really pisses her off. So Hera is someone who definitely, when she say "I do," I commit this to death, tears us apart. That's her,、um, and she will look after the husband's social calendar. She'll be the great, you know, social butterfly to organize parties or whatever. If that's the the thing you're into, <clears throat> but she's definitely、um, can be the face of the family as well. So, but when that. Got challenged when that got violated. She definitely was angry, and I think in the modern interpretation, not like because in the myths that she, I think, blew typhoon in the whole island and really devastating everyone. But I think in reality, she could be quite dramatic, and her her pain can be very loud and very painful. Um. So, but what I found is that as time changes in the modern world, women have more opportunity, so she can really start to define who she is on her own. So the who are you question really come into play, where she doesn't have necessarily need to be someone's wife. It, it's wonderful to have a partner, but without that, she can still really shine in her own authority. So I think that's something really for her to recognize more and more so now with her archetype. In a modern society, but the example I can give you is Jackie Kennedy. I really think she was one of the most respected first lady. <clears throat> she didn't maybe. <coughs> excuse me. If you compare to different humanitarian efforts, so that some maybe do more, some do less. Nevertheless, she's definitely one very memorable first lady. So, next up we have the goddess of beauty and love, which is.、Um, Aphrodite, and you can see. I like to make the picture. So I work with a designer to create these goddess archetypes images, and I don't like to have a cliche and typical because for me, Aphrodite is red hair, <laughs> not the blonde hair like the birth of Venus that you made. Actually, her hair was orange too, was it? Not blonde, but I, I, I don't know. For me, she's the most exciting and interesting archetype because. Actually, she's in all of us. Part of us is about love and beauty, and it's definitely about transformation. So her archetype is alchemist. The thing about Aphrodite is that she is so present with you. So forget about being like mesmerized with her beauty and all that stuff. It's really about she's so present. She really sees you. She'll hear you. You know, so many times. You know, I heard Oprah said that. What people want and need at the end of every interview that she have done over thirty five thousand. If did you hear that? Did I do it all right? Did you get that? They want to be heard. People want to be visible. People want to matter. Visible. I don't mean you need to be celebrity. I mean you need to feel you matter. What you said was heard, understood. Aphrodite is very specially good at that because she hold in her presence. She really see. The potential in you, and she helps you to develop it, to transform it, to bring it out. 
What kind of magical power is this? Of course, everybody is mesmerized by her. Of course, wouldn't. So I think that's really important. And the other thing is that she also participates in that. It's not that sort of imagine this、um, conversation be- between a psychologist and and a patient or client, and it's sort of one way, and you don't involve yourself. You you let them talk. That's I think the general practice. But with Aphrodite, no, 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 no. She's super involved. It, as in. When you in a conversation, a relationship with her, she's changing with you because maybe what she sees in you inspire her, or what you share with her makes her think about her life. So she will also tell you that. So that becomes a chemical reaction. So you both reacting. <laughs> But that's what makes it so wonderful. So a、uh, lots of Aphrodite will be. Let's say you have a very strong Aphrodite in you. That could be someone working in a creative profession. Or also again, coaching a healthy profession because for us, I think when I work with a client, have tremendous results. It changes me as well because they inspire me. So that's sort of two way street with Aphrodite, and that's why she's so magical and powerful. Not just about her beauty, and I don't want that to be the number one thing you remember about her. If anything, you take from today, it's about transformation, right? So that's Aphrodite, and.、Um, One thing to be mindful of is because this power is so attractive that people may、um, romantically interest in her clearly, and sometimes she may have boundary issues to actually really let people know clearly that is platonic and nothing else. And when someone spends so much time in you, seems so interested in you, you may think they are interested in you. Also romantically, but for her it may not be the case. But even if that's the case, it may not necessarily last forever because she can move on to the next project, the next person. Not in a mean way,、um, not just about change of heart, but for her that could be a beginning and end. And if she was with you romantically, she was really with you. She was in love with you, but she could also、um, stop and change. And that's the thing that may find it very difficult. Um, when you involve with Aphrodite, so both, you know, she need to be mindful of how she handles handles this,、um, but for also other people around her need to also see that about her. Again, it's part of her pattern. Like you know, even my father told me once that you know when that was when I was younger, I have numerous boyfriends, all serious, and that's what he said. You know, I was serious about every single one at that time. So that was really like you know I'm not trying to say I have like tons of boyfriend or whatever, but、uh, with the feel that you know my father met, that's how he felt. He perceived it as it wasn't that I wasn't serious with any one of them, but that was at the time. But then the time may end. But how you handle it, that shows you what kind of how powerful, how mature you are as a woman. So sometimes for girl, Aphrodite girl to become Aphrodite woman, there is a, that. Could be a distinction, which is something we need all need to be mindful of, because many of you listening could be an Aphrodite, even though you may not admit it or you don't think about it, you know, much. It 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 is very possible that it is kind of the archetype within all of us. Sometimes it's more activated when you're enjoying doing what you do. You may actually express it more. You may come, you know, more obviously as an Aphrodite. You don't even know. So be mindful of that. Now. I want to talk about the intuitive exercise we did before. So, because I think you may recognize one or two of these goddess you were most attracted to or drawn to. You don't know why. Now, with the brief explanation, so even if you haven't read the book, you kind of get the idea about each of them. Then you should compare notes whether you really、um, pick the one that are very similar to who you are, or maybe something you need to call upon or. I call it. I say borrow. <laughs>、um, so when I was younger and when I was just about to become a mom, I think I needed more Demeter energy in me because otherwise I was just planning everything as we go, and you know there's no time for the baby. <laughs> But、um, I think it's very interesting because、um, in a lots of conversation I'm with people, they often say it's the same same one. So they may be very drawn to Artemis on the picture, and it turns out. They are Artemis, but then some of them say, "Oh, it's so interesting because I actually don't have much diameter in me, but I picture maybe it says something." I said, "Yeah, probably yes."、Um, so just you know, think about it and see what comes up. 
And uh, another thing I want to mention, if you want to, first of all, if you want to get my book, you can um, go to Amazon and most of the book outlets online, you can get them. You can get them from Perfect Potion um, if you want both physical book and ebook. Um, Perfect Potion only stock physical book. Um, you can get it from the website as well as Amazon and other book depository, you name it. So you can easily get the book. And I also have a quiz for you to do if you want to get a profile about which archetypes you, you have the most active in you or the least active in you. That's a short quiz I created. Um, probably take you 10 minutes um, to submit. So it's all online. You just need to come to my website, www.cwinveto.com. You can um, access that what I call the goddess bundle, which have a, I think, a short introduction um, and uh, and the quiz. So up to you if you're interested. So now, so next thing I want to talk to you about is where are you? So I share about this concept also in my book about, you know, the four seasons in our life. So we've got the maiden, the uh, mother, the matriarch and the wise woman. So I don't follow the maiden mother crone because I think now we have more time and lots of people when they may be in the 50s or when their children are you know grown and they left home, they, they're not that old. It's, and there's still a lot of energy, there's a lot of opportunity. They may have a big career already or they have worked all their life. And now they enter what I call golden age. Um, they can really find something meaningful for themselves to do. And they can still invite change, in fact. So I expand it to the fourth season. And when you're a wise woman, doesn't mean you, you know, you do nothing. But it's more like I take a backseat role, like a mentor or sharing your wisdom. So I call it the wise woman, not crone. So as you can see, I, I like it as a four season picture. They're all very juicy and beautiful in their own right. And I think why I want to mention this is because I think at each stage, we are invited to a transformation, what I call the heroine journey. Sometimes it's, it's like if it's biological, you really can't escape, is it, when you are changing from a young girl to woman or when you go through menopause, you know, or becoming pregnant. You can't escape it. it the changes are imminent. Now, what you're going to do about it is another matter. And then sometimes things come unexpectedly. It could be circumstances. It could be a physical illness. It could be anything or emotional challenges. So these things brought on things that in your life where kind of push you or lead you to what I call the heroine journey, which is inner and outer transformation. Now, I consider any hero or hero journey to be a um, parallel thing, as in externally you're looking for an outcome or a destination. So this is a typical hero journey symbol you can get in any, um, on the internet, but it just kind of show you a little bit about the journey where you call for adventure. So you start in your, your ordinary world, which is the world that you know as you know it. And then you may be pushed by the angel or something really like um, propel you to go on it. And sometimes you don't even want to. That was the reluctant hero, right? So sometimes, as I mentioned before, as a woman, we go through so many transitions, like it or not. Biological, emotional, physical, spiritual, you name it. And and let's just say one way or the other, we, we get on the adventure. So we often will receive aid, we have help. Um, and then later on, we will go through what we call the trial, um, which is actually about learning your lessons. So you can see we're kind of descending. So usually you will have help. You may have wizards visit, you have goddess visits, or you know, book drop on your head, or you found a teacher, or listening to a, uh, a seminar, a book, whatever, to help you on your journey. So you always with help. If you ask, you will... If you ask for support and help, help is always out there. Whether you have to pay for it, whether it's free, it doesn't matter. It's there. you got to trust this. So you never go on an adventure, what I call, um, you know, hero and journey or soul adventure, as Joseph Campbell talked about it. You are never alone. We're all on it. Different stages, different type, different kinds, but we're all on it. Now, I said before, let's parallel going it's external which is your outer destination your outer goal you want to change jobs you want to find a guy to get married or you know um whatever like slay the dragon get the princess 
But internally, you're also going through a transformation, which is actually what really matters. Because if you didn't become who you need to be to reach the destination, you will never get there. So I love to use it with the movie plot, like for example, Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, or、um, Star Wars. A lot of them go through the hero journey. And actually, in fact, Joseph Campbell was the mentor for George Lucas. So you definitely see this journey play out in the movie sense. But I, I was to point. I want to point out the internal journey. So if Fredo did not become brave, doesn't understand friendship, doesn't understand he is you know powerful in many ways, even though he doesn't look like much of it as a um as a, um as a hobbit, is who he became. The transformation happened internally that led him to ultimately fulfill the task. So it's the same for all of us. If you want to be the number one CEO somewhere, what internally needs to happen first and foremost is actually what we need to look at. Now I, I cover a lot more in this、um, in my coaching program. So if you're interested to get help or guidance or navigate. Anyway, a buddy on this work definitely contact me, and I do work one to one because I think some of these things it's great to work in a group setting to get the concepts and you know play around with ideas. But if you want to go deep, if you really want to work on something specifically, I definitely recommend one to one coaching on that. Whether it's about finding your life purpose, or finding the relationship, or changing the relationship you have, or about your career work. Anything, really. If you want to go deeper, I, I do recommend one to one, whether with me or someone else. I think there's a tremendous value in working with someone like a coach or mentor, because that will really makes a huge difference. Anyway, so continue on.、Um, when we have different trial and lessons and challenges and temptations, and then we get get to the bottom of it, which is. Belly of the whale, really, which is the death and rebirth as a theme, which does not mean you'll be dead. It means a breakthrough, and sometimes before a breakthrough is a breakdown, but a lot of times it's more about really changing the perception, the transformation. What I said before, from fear to love, often is to see it beyond and above what you used to see, letting go of the fear, understand the bigger picture, knowing you can do it. That revelation sometimes is bigger than anything. It obviously, you, you, if you want evidence, if there is evidence, it helps. But sometimes internal understanding that gets you there. Once you get the revelation, you are completely on different directions. So you will, you have the transformation, and then you will move upward, and you. Let's say you finally got the tools, the knowledge, the know-how, the team assembled, and you did your task, and eventually, you know, you succeed, and you will have to integrate back into your known world, which is your conscious world, which is the world as you know it. But now you are different. So going back to where you were doesn't always work unless you make some changes to reintegrate what you have known. So if you became like a super healthy person after. A transformation journey, you can't go back to old habits, right? So you need to change that too. So that's a different topic. But one of the thing I didn't mention so much is about atonement here, but it will be essential for your ascension, because atonement is about forgiveness, and forgiveness all the time is not about saying what you did to me was okay or what I did was okay, even though it was horrible things. It's about seeing the bigger picture, going beyond and above. It's not denial; it's a recognition beyond and above the person who have done you wrong. And as in the way I say it, people did you wrong because they have their own story. They were wrong because they're blinded by their ego, or they make a mistake. But in a true nature, when they are not so insane, involved in their own story or illusion, or ego mind. Or their nightmare, they would behave differently. If they were babies, nobody do anybody harm, right? Everybody born pure. So if I see beyond and above that, I see the name human nature, and the soul within. Then I can forgive. I can forgive that person based on that, not what he did. Now, once you did that, you really gone beyond to the next level. So that's a very important part to integrate into your new world. So that was like a long and short breakdown of the hero journey. Now I do have some questions 
um, that I have prepared. So if you want to pause, you can. I want to ask you, are you being called for an adventure? And are you answering the call? And if so, where do you want to go? Is there something that been bubbling around in your mind? Usually, when you listen to presentation like that, whatever comes up is probably the one that your subconscious is trying to tell you. Because I find it all the time uh, in myself and others. And also, Carl Jung talks about it, how his whole life is studying himself, as in how his unconscious or subconscious trying to express itself in the conscious. So, anyway, my question is, are you answering your call? I want to quickly share with you this heart exercise because maybe you have a question um, at this point, or maybe you have an idea, or maybe there is a problem you wonder how you can handle. Now, we cover a lot of different materials, and I hope you got some ideas and you're trying to get some insights within yourself as well. So one other thing I want to bring you here, it's about heart intelligence. So your heart knows everything, your head may not. And the distance between the two, it's, there's no distance between them. But the time it takes to get there could be different. So what I want to say is that ask your heart, is probably the best, wisest way. You can ask everybody for opinions and evidence and all that stuff, but at the end, you make the decision, right? So your heart knows a lot more than you know. In fact, the science have told us now that when you meet someone, immediately your heart knows whether it is someone you can trust or not, but what they listen to is another matter. And they also found 40,000 neurons in uh, around the heart. So basically, this is your other brain. And it's connected to every part of your body as well. So um, this exercise is very simple and I think can help you to maybe ask yourself those questions that I post. It may be a different question, but if you want an answer, ask a simple question. And that's what I wanted to do. So this is just only a few snaps with this exercise. I learned it from Heart Math, which you can also Google and look up. Very simple. First of all, you need to close your eye and sit down and take some deep breaths. In and out. Just start to relax and calm yourself down with slow breaths. Slow breaths show that you're not in danger. So your body recognizes a safe place. So as you listen, continue to take some slow breaths. And relax. And then if it's possible, and if that's okay with you, Put your hand on your heart, like touch your heart. It can be on your clothes or on your skin. You can use the whole palm or you can use your fingers, doesn't matter. But connect to your heart because when you do that, you put the, the tension to it. It kind of open up another gateway and also your energy will flow both ways. Your heart to your body, the hand, through your hand and vice versa. So put your hand on your heart and just connect. Be aware of the area of your heart. Be aware of your heart. And then when you're ready, start to think about feelings associated with these words. Appreciation. Care. Gratitude. Peace. Think about the memory, story, images, words, things that in your past or present that are associated with these words. Appreciation. Who do you appreciate? Care. Gratitude. What are you grateful for? Peace. When you are submerged in that feeling, that really blissful feeling, then ask your heart the question. Could be the question you have in mind, could be one of the questions I mentioned. Or simply ask yourself, what is my deepest desire? 
what is my deepest desire? You can pause it at any time. Let the answer flow to you. Let it come out. You can write it down after. But hold on this feeling and listen to your heart. So this is a very simple exercise, but I find it extremely useful and helpful. And I think the fact that when you go through the first couple of steps, you immediately become more calm and relaxed. So you don't have the mind spinning all over, which you can, it can help you to hear your heart. So ask your heart, your heart knows. Now to wrap up today's presentation, I just want to say we all have gifts, unique gifts to give to others. They're only gifts if they are meant to give away. So we all have something unique. It could be our talent. It could be our experience. It could be the interest. It could be our life story that could really make a difference to one another. And you know, one other thing I really want to end with here is that if you look at every spiritual tradition, so religion and anything in serious manner, that about spirituality, about who we are. All this teaching boils down to one thing. It's about love one another. It's never about love for yourself, compete, get the best of it. That's not spiritual teachings. The real deep spiritual teaching or the best social movement in the world, it's always about you see something not right and you know that's not a loving act and it's an invitation of right the wrongs. That's an act of love. And that's all about, it's all about that is love one another. If you love one another, you wouldn't, you wouldn't yell at this person. You wouldn't throw the trash. You know, you wouldn't do certain things to harm one another. If that's what in your mind, if your mind is about fear for one another, love yourself, then yeah, it's all about competition, is it? And that's never, it's always about fear, it's never about love. So I want you to really sink into this. And you, you have something in you that you would love to bring out to the world, whether it's individuals or a collective, it's small, big scale, whatever. It doesn't matter. Everybody has their own purpose, especially different stage in your life. Maybe your purpose when you're 20s is different when you're 50s. But nevertheless, there's something calling you, whether it's changing something in your life or something bigger, um, affecting more people, it doesn't matter. But listen to your heart and answer that call. And we talked about it at the beginning of the talk. We talk about who we are, who we are as women. Who we are is that we are people who stand up and show up. And we evolve and we shine our light, not our fear. If there is something in you, don't be controlled by fear, but liberated by love. So I end with you the famous quote from Mary Williamson, who someone I admire, truly courageous woman, truly inspirational. In her book, in uh, The Return of Love, there's a very famous quote that many people talked about, which is, our biggest fear is not that we are inadequate, but we are powerful beyond measure. So think about it. By knowing your deepest desire, by believing in yourself, by willing to change, to act and to love, and by becoming who you really are, you are empowered. So now go forth in peace and go forth in confidence. Create and live an incredible life so the women before you will be proud and the women come after you will be guided. And so it is. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation and thank you.